Well, talking about uh, quantum theory reminds me of an anecdote. Uh, when I was a student of physics, we had a very good and ambitious professor of quantum mechanics. And he said, look, the learning of quantum mechanics is simply acoustical accustomation. And that will do. And in a sense, it worked. I mean, I never understood it, but I was able to apply it. <laughs> that is perhaps enough. And so maybe with decoupling, uh, you may not understand it. I don't either. Uh, but I'm able, more or less, to apply it. Uh, before going further, I have to uh, inform you of something. There is Dirk Wilutsky, who is a journalist from Germany who wants to film my appearance here. I don't know why, but uh, anyway, if you have objections of being on the pictures, tell him. Tell me, tell him. OK? Fine. Uh, the first two slides, including the cover slide, got, got lost in the rain. I don't know why. It just didn't uh, <laughs> show up. But this is the first substantive slide and essentially asked, why decoupling? Which decoupling? And then I was thinking to talk about the International Panel for Sustainable Resource Management, which I'm co-chairing, and then the Factor 5 story and the rest. So uh, the term decoupling, in a way, is very old. I mean, all conventional environmental policy has been about decoupling. Decoupling economic growth, well-being, etc., from the environmental nuisances. In the beginning, this was essentially pollution, pollution control. But as of more recent, mainly the topic is decoupling economic well-being from resource use. And this essentially is the meaning the OECD, the Club of the Rich Countries, has given it. And this is a quote from 2001. In the meantime, many, many studies have been published uh, referring to decoupling. This is an OECD one on transport, decoupling uh, environmental impacts of transport from economic growth. And it is always a bit of a mixed agenda. Environmental impact can be uh, chemical, but it also can be resource use. And today I shall be concentrating on resource use. And that's another report that came out quite recently uh, with a uh, strong emphasis on the South. And I'll uh, show you a slide in a moment where the distinction is made between absolute and relative decoupling. And the South insists that they only can do relative decoupling. Now, what kind of decoupling is needed? Is it indeed decoupling from pollution? Well, I suggest that today, with near 7 billion people wanting decent lifestyles, and today's American lifestyles are very resource intensive and unsustainable. We need, I suggest, to, to decouple decent living from resource intensity. And then I'm arguing that this is technically feasible. So this is the, uh, uh, I'm showing you two slides, this one and this one. Uh, this is the typical northern view that there is decoupling of economic activity from resource use, which is the sort of parallel line. It's the upper agenda. And the second one is decoupling from environmental impact. This is our mainstream kind of thinking. If you talk with people in developing countries, you typically see this picture, which is different. It says there is the relative decoupling. This is our agenda in China, in India, etc. And then there is absolute decoupling. This is what the rich countries have to do. And there are wonderful success stories of decoupling. After the Montreal Protocol on the protection of the ozone layer, the 
fluorofluorocarbon were phased out. They are, to a large extent, disappearing. California has decoupled to an uh, astonishing extent energy consumption from wells. Well, it is still, I believe it's per capita, um, still parallel. It's not going down. But even this is a huge success, actually done mostly by the PUC uh, under Art Rosenfeld, who retired last week. You may have seen some features in the local press. He, he is an absolute hero in changing California to the better. And there is a Dutch study of decoupling. They are also proud of an absolute decoupling between GDP and CO2, which is quite remarkable for an industrialized country. And now let me say a few words about the um, International Panel for Sustainable Resource Management that was created actually the day before I came to your lovely dinner party. Uh, it was in Budapest. And um, I'm the co-chair. The other co-chair was Ismail Serageldin, the former vice president of the World Bank, and now is Ashok Kozla, a wonderful hero of mine. He is now the president of IUCN, and he is the founder of Development Alternatives in India, an organization that has created roughly 3 million sustainable jobs in rural India. That in a time span of 15 or 20 years. It's admirable. Um, OK. The core mis mission, as I see it, and as Achim Steiner, the executive director of UNEP, sees it, is finding pathways to decoupling in various areas. So we have a number of working groups, one on decoupling, then one on biofuels, metals, water, and uh, impact assessment. The first report came out just a couple of months ago. It's the biofuels uh, report. I actually have it in my pocket, uh, and the CD is available. If the Brent School wants it, uh, you, you can have it. Uh, that would be then the full report. Um, the, uh, I have the summary report in paper and the full report on, on the disk. Um, it found that many biofuels are making things work, uh, worse, but some help decoupling from carbon dioxide emissions without too big uh, negative effects otherwise. Biofuels is still very much a marginal affair. Um, 0.3% of the energy pie, uh, but having um, uncommensurate uh, ecological damages. Next report will be on metals. Roland, you know Tom Gradle? He was also here in Santa Barbara in November 2008 and is a great scientist, researcher, and a very good organizer. He really steers this metals group. Uh, he's planning to publish six reports. One of the early findings is that the end-of-life recycling rate for um, most of those fancy, sought-after, rare metals, such as indium or gallium, or neodym, or whatever you have, uh, partly rare earths yeah, on the at the bottom, and uh, otherwise very, very valuable things for high tech, have a re recycling rate less than 1%, which is a scandal. And of course, an invitation to entrepreneurs and engineers to do better, and thereby help decoupling, um, wealth creation using high tech from digging in the ground and from using energy. Because uh, recycling is always a lot more energy e efficient than is the digging and uh, refining. The fourth group 
is on board water, chaired by Professor Kevin Urama from Nigeria, will concentrate on water efficiency. If you look into the water um, literature, 95% or more is on more supplies. You see that in California. And this is the wrong strategy. This group looked at important impacts. And the main sectors to be looked at is construction, transport, and food. And the group will look at uh, decoupling there. And then, finally, the decoupling gr group proper uh, will present first a report on concepts. It's nearly done. Uh, and major facts, as well as uh, four case studies, which are there on different countries. And you see quite clearly that China and South Africa have no decoupling, no absolute decoupling whatsoever. And in many sectors, not even relative decoupling. So, but we felt we should describe it. And the second group will address opportunities and policies of decoupling. This is essentially the, the theme of my colloquium talk today. Now the question is, why a factor of five of decoupling? is magic? Well, in a way it is. It indicates it must be better than a factor of four. And actually, the reason why the new report uh, cannot be called factor four is the Chinese language. In, chi in Chinese, four signifies um, mishap. The Chinese told me, you cannot possibly publish an optimistic book called Factor 4. Uh, so it's now Factor 5. But there are also reasons, uh, quasi-mathematical reasons, why we are going for a Factor 5. Uh, one is the ecological footprints. You know, they vary widely between rich and poor countries and what you can do is create, as Matisse Wackernagel does, the sort of main promoter of the footprint idea, you can create uh, an area of footprints plotted upwards and the human development index, meaning well living, more or less, um, to the right. And then you have the sustainable uh, development quadrant or rectangle, and that would mean small footprints and high human development index. Now, the trouble is that today, countries are not in that rectangle. Either they are too poor, the human development index is too small, or uh, they are too rich and they consume too much resources. So, what we should do is move the poor countries to the right and pull the rich countries down into the sustainability rectangle. And then if you look at the picture again, a factor of five should more or less do the job. Uh, by reducing the size of the footprint and uh, by increasing uh, human development index. Okay, I mean, it's a bit of mathematical magic, you know. But then you, in, uh, you all know that uh, Ehrlich Holdren um, equation, as they call it, um, impact with population times affluence times a technology factor. Now, T is the decoupling factor. And then what you can do is Google the term global consumption growth calculator. It leads you to a Danish industrialist's homepage and instruction for calculating the necessary T to stabilize the environment under IPAT uh, assumptions. Then you have some plausible assumptions about necessary or desired growth in the poor countries and in the rich countries and about population growth and uh, etc. And then you calculate how much should T shrink to stabilize I. And whatever 
assumptions you make, you arrive at anything between a factor of 4 and a factor of 20 or so. And one fifth is still a very optimistic assumption. So a factor of 5 is optimistic. Uh, we had a Professor Ryuchi Yamamoto as a, a colloquium speaker here three years ago. And he also said to the Brent audience, a factor of five was necessary to avoid resource disaster. Then if we want climate stabilization, we need decoupling of wealth from CO2. This is a new Dutch study, roughly uh, arriving at a factor of five. Or you look at the Stern re review from business as usual down to s the stabilization um, path. And the longer we wait, as you know, the more radical uh, the changes have to be, then you will have to have a factor of 20 or so. Uh, better stay with the modest factors. It's much easier. All reasonable scenarios of climate stabilization seem to lead to decoupling needs in the vicinity of a factor of five, at least. And if you go by the fears of Jim Hansen and others, if you want to reach 350 ppm instead of 450, uh, then you better go for a factor of eight or so. And the time span is perhaps uh, 40 years. Now, so far, carbon uh, uh, wealth goes with carbon intensity. And what we have to do is creating a Kuznets curve, a decoupling curve of decarbonization. And then persuade the developing countries to tunnel through that curve. This is essentially the agenda of post Copenhagen. Now, how do we respond to the uh, challenge? There are essentially three options reduce the carbon intensity of energy, reduce energy intensity of wealth, or reduce wealth. What you typically hear in the politi political domain is. Well, everything is about less carbon per unit of energy, including carbon capture and storage. I am very hesitant about this conventional view and suggest instead, well, maybe 30% less carbon per unit of energy. This is essentially the renewable energies. And 65%, two thirds of the task should be less energy per GDP and perhaps 5% less energy uh, perhaps uh, le less wealth. And this is the uh, book that was just published, um, and it has a number of examples, of course. It, uh, while factor four was more or less anecdotal and had 50 examples here and there picked, uh, hoping that they would spread, but ha they hardly do. We now have a more systematic sectoral approach, the construction sector the agricultural sector, the transport sector, the heavy industry sector, and then look at the economics and mechanics of uh, those sectors and what can be done in a system approach. And then we look at the policies. So this is the now nearly architectural standard for new buildings, the so-called passive houses. My wife and I are living in one such lovely house. It's great fabulous um, air quality and living quality, and only one-tenth of the energy need. And this can also be done with old existing buildings by refurbishing. Not exactly a factor of 10 is reached, but something uh, like a factor of 8, which is good. Then, of course, next door, you know, Sushi Nakamura does the LED technology. And uh, this is now a commercial um, lamp uh, produced by Philips, but there are also uh, Japanese manufacturers. And then from conventional, very high intensity Portland cement, you can go to so-called geopolymer cement. Actually, the ashes from volcanoes also can serve as geopolymer um, feedstock 
for cement manufacturing. And that can be done more or less at room temperature. And the Coliseum in Rome was built with that, some kind of a cement. And it's still there. While modern concrete constructions that you have, bridges, etc., become mechanically problematic after 50 years or so. You know those stories. So um, geopolymers is really an option. The problem is its scarcity. But fortunately for us, um, each coal power plant, which for other reasons are not so desirable, is producing a lot of fly ash. And that fly ash, having gone through the burning process, also serves as geopolymers. And of course, Amory Lovins, the co-author of Factor 4, is now uh, into the SUV revolution and says we can do something like uh, a liter and a half per 100 kilometers, which I believe is the equivalent of 100 uh, miles per gallon or something like that which is easily a factor of five better than today's fleet, as SUVs at least, or from rotten trains and huge highways to high-speed trains, which is more, more or less the East Asian model, uh, and much less on the highway. And then, of course, a tenfold increase of metals recycling. It's not only about the energy. It's about materials as well and water and all the rest. Uh, so this all can be done. It's technically available. The question is, how can we make it happen? That's a very interesting question. Because it does not happen by itself. Emery Lovins came up with his hypercar free revolution uh, idea nearly 20 years ago. And you don't see them on the street. Why? I mean, Detroit went for the SUV fleet instead at the time when the hypercar was already there as a blueprint. So what happened? Well, part of the answer is that oil got very cheap. And then it was so seductive to go for big cars, you know. But to make it happen, I believe one of the very important things in our civilization is a new mindset. The old mindset has always been progress means increasing labor productivity. There was broad consensus between labor and employers. Both benefited from it, except that it created some unemployment. But uh, otherwise, it was a broad consensus. But today, labor is not scarce. Otherwise, we wouldn't have unemployment. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, estimates something like 800 million jobs would be needed to have anything like full employment with decent jobs. So why throw all that innovation money into further increases of labour productivity? Why not, for a change, uh, switch the investments towards Resource productivity, because resources are scarce. So on a, on a national scale, that should be a very good strategy. On the microeconomic scale of the firm, it need not, as long as resources are cheap and uh, labor is expensive. Now, labor productivity has increased 20-fold in 150 years or so. And looking at the examples that my Australian co-authors, Charlie Hargroves and his team, and Amory Lovins in the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, and myself have been identifying, looking at those opportunities, I think that a, an increase tenfold in 100 years and fivefold in 50 years should in no way be utopian. We can do this. But now have a look at the historical development of the increase of labor productivity. And there you find that labor productivity went up step by step in parallel with labor costs 
It rages. It, the grass rages. So predictably, the increase of labor productivity would become more profitable each consecutive year. And this is why people invested it. Investors are not stupid. They know where the money earns money. So what you have to do now is a strategy of actively elevating energy prices. You have to avoid social hardship or capital destruction or other unpleasant things. <coughs> you better increase them only in parallel with documented energy productivity increases. Because then, by definition, the monthly pay for energy does not increase. Th that should be socially acceptable, shouldn't it? And there is a high price elasticity. This is empirical data about energy consumption per GDP versus household electricity prices in various countries. More or less the same story with petrol prices or gasoline. Um, if you have low petrol prices, you have a high consumption. And if you have high petrol prices, you have low consumption. It's nearly an ideal um, elasticity curve. But this is the biggest surprise. If you look at the historical development of prices for resources, including energy, you see a systematic decline over 200 years, caused essentially by technological progress in digging and transporting. And today, uh, digging machines, are, I mean, they fill the campus of, uh, of UCSB, you know. It's huge things with very, uh, very little labor. So this is why it's getting, uh, getting cheaper. Even metals that are considered very valuable and scarce, for instance, copper, are available to no end. There is a study I was reading by uh, Professor Tilton, I believe is his name, who estimates that at today's um, used rate of copper, the Earth Trust would supply copper for another 120 million years. So the Earth's crust is not the reason for scarcity. But we have good reasons why we should not overuse copper. Partly the, uh, its toxicity, partly the energy needs for this digging and uh, operation, etc. Okay, so prices are falling, and uh, what we have to do is politically, artificially increase prices. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Now, how we do, do we do that? There are essentially two different methods. One is direct pricing instrument, and one is indirect. The indirect one is cap and trade, which is the favorite for carbon dioxide. Essentially meaning you say so much is allowed, and then you people trade for the permits. That has numerous disadvantages, one of them being the unpredictable fluctuation. This is the price curve for carbon dioxide permits in Europe. And all of a sudden, you see it collapsing. So everybody having invested in reducing carbon dioxide is losing all his money. Now this is very unple unpleasant as a result for uh, the result of that strategy. Other unpleasant results are that if prices jump upwards, you see the poor no longer able to, to use that resource. So I suggest that a predictable trajectory of direct pricing is by far 
the most benign, both for the poor and for the investor, for the rich. It gives predictability. It is invaluable. We did such a thing uh, when I was member of parliament, introducing a petrol tax in small steps increasing. And surprise, surprise, it led to a decoupling of mobility from petrol use. You can do that. The British did more or less the same for completely different reasons. We did it more or less for ecological reasons, also because we wanted to have that money to reduce indirect labor costs. So the whole operation led to an increase of the workforce of some 300,000 in Germany, which is quite a lot, because uh, indirect tra um, labor prices went down. Um, while in Canada and the US, we had no such thing, because here it's not politically feasible to, uh, to tax petrol or gasoline. So you had increase. Then it can, you cannot possibly argue that in 1993, Canada and the US were poor countries. A developing country. No, no, no. It is just additional consumption. You can say, uh, call it overconsumption. And with the introduction of the SUV tax. And for fiscal conservatives, it may be important to know that during those five years of increased energy taxes, the overall tax burden in Germany decreased. You can do that if you insist. I do not, but uh, others do. So it's, uh, you can decouple uh, a reasonable uh, energy taxation policy from uh, the overall tax burden. What I also can uh, conceive of is a corridor of increasing energy prices so that much can still be left to uh, little market fluctuations. But the pre predictability would lie in the corridor. I've been uh, selling this idea to the Chinese in the context of the China Council for um, Environment and Development. And we delivered the report uh, with that as the core result uh, last November. We are still waiting for the reception of that report in the uh, Chinese leadership. High energy prices need not hurt the economy. Japan went ahead with high energy prices during the uh, mid-1970s uh, that had chiefly the reason that they wanted to become less dependent on oil imports and uh, other reasons. And surprise, surprise, the Japanese simply were running ahead of the global economy letting the dinosaur industries leave, such as aluminum smelting from bauxite, and at the same time creating, at the time, the fifth computer generation, which is not energy intensive, but knowledge intensive. So it was a good strategy for Japan's economy and jobs. And of course, the Soviet Union insisting on Lenin's ideology that energy should be free was a disaster. It was one of the main reasons for the economic collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, Achim Steiner, who created that resource panel, is now calling for a green economy development initiative worldwide, um, which is a wonderful agenda. And uh, essentially, he believes that this is the industrial future for the world. And he gave us the honor of attending the Beijing meeting of our resource panel in November. And there he said that decoupling was at the core of the mandate of our group. And he believes, as I do, that the next Kondratiev cycle, long wave cycle of technology and growth, will be green because the old five cycles, such as mechanization, uh, railroads, electricity, TV, etc., etc., they all were essentially 
um, expands it using more energy and material resources. We can no longer afford that one. But we still want more. Well, as I said at the beginning, 7 billion people want that. So the only way out, if we want growth of wealth, will be that new technological revolution. And that's all I wanted to say to you. Thank you very much. And we have 15 minutes left for discussion. Thank you. That's a very good question. <laughs> well, the reasons why I am sort of skeptical about nuclear power has very little to do with the resource agenda. There is a resource argument, that, uh, though. The geological reach of profitable uranium mining is less than the geological reach of natural gas. So it's in no way an unlimited resource. So if anybody tells you that this is the answer to global warming, it's wrong for geological reasons. In addition, if you ask insurance companies to cover the entire risk, they say no. They say that's uh, an affair for the people to do, which is equivalent to the risk of global warming, which isn't insured either. But ask any chemical company uh, to do without insurance coverage. They would never get, uh, get a license for operation. But the nuclear lobby wants that, exactly that. That's unfair. So. Uh, nuclear is a story of its own. I, I left it out because um, it's a different story. But it's one of the good reasons for me rather to lie on decoupling energy from wealth than carbon from energy. Yes, please. Having been in politics myself as member of parliament, I tend to believe that tea is by far the easiest to address. You can do something about population in authoritarian countries like China or Singapore. It is very difficult in America. Even in India, it's very difficult. There is good reason to believe that population stabilizes once prosperity sets in. And this is actually a very interesting, intriguing um, message from a new paper written by this man, Afro Kozla, who is my co-chair. He calculates the cost of reducing carbon dioxide during the next 50 years by making poor people in India richer. Because then they have less children, according to certain statistics that are available. And then they will need uh, less people will need less carbon dioxide. And he more or less estimates that it, it is something like four times cheaper than carbon capture and storage. Now, this is a bit of a mystical um, calculation. Nevertheless, it indicates that you can also work on T, on A. Uh, you can also work, as people do in Thailand, after the king's, King Bumipol's initiative to 
go for a sufficiency economy. He wants to make Thailand less vulnerable to currency fluctuations. That was his reason officially. Um, but again, as a politician in a typical Western country, Germany, I feel it is horrendously difficult to advertise less affluence. So he appears to be the easiest choice. Yes, Tim. essentially a competition, I suggest, between the power of innovation on one side and finding the right direction on the other. The best of all worlds is to combine the two <laughs> <coughs> and saying, let us as Western freedom-loving Democrats um, politically agree on that rather benign trajectory of increasing price, uh, energy prices, <coughs> leaving a lot of freedom and <coughs> giving huge encouragement to investors and engineers and uh, academics, etc., to go for that. Uh, I believe if we can politically agree on this trajectory, we have all the benefits of the Chinese path without all the disbenefits which are there. land use story is very conflictual, very important, and we looked at it in the biofuels study, where we found out that biofuels monocultures typically aggressively destroy biodiversity and should be avoided. And the relatively small pockets of benign biofuels are um, <coughs> agricultural residues that can be transformed into biogas or biofuels. Um, I cannot claim uh, having done anything like serious research on the nexus between resources and biodiversity, but uh, my wife knows better, uh, really. I mean, this is serious. I, she is involved in all those international negotiations of the Biodiversity Convention. Uh, uh, say what you, what you know. many of the agricultural policies and um, invites new partners and as well in FAO as in many countries the agricultural lobby tries to mute that global study which is very important indeed and which gives a lot of hints to your regarding your question thank you thank you yes please
you're absolutely right. Had this been a talk on global warming, I couldn't have avoided this question. Because indeed, animal husbandry means more greenhouse gases. And uh, in particular, cattle. Um, it's the C84 uh, coming out of the behind of the cattle, uh, methane. And partly it is um, nitrous uh, N2O. What is that in English? Well, nitrous oxide, yeah. Um, that is also associated in part with uh, animals. It also occurs uh, in plant production. So all in all, you can say the vegetarian Indian diet is probably the best you can do. Vegetarian Western diet is the second best. A good mix as we had it in Europe and America, let us say, 80 years ago, is the third best. And the typical today's very meat-intensive diet of America or Australia, or for that matter, much of Europe, is the worst. It is actually part of wave five. Uh, I believe it was five, yes. And can be absolutely exciting in reducing the specific needs for energy or materials because it is so elegant. On the other hand, as you know, there are other hazards which have to be considered and weighed against the resource benefits. So uh, I've not done any um, specific assessment of it. I'm interested in nanotechnologies, no doubt. But what the so-called ETC group is publishing on the hazards of nanotechnology, uh, I find quite serious. And uh, <coughs> it's a novel kind of pollution, which simply has to be taken into account, and I'm not an expert. Maybe this could be part of your work. <laughs> I mean, you are doing it anyway. <laughs> so that's fantastic. I think one thing we might consider in the question of land use, energy resources, food production, is to think more carefully about aquaculture and different types of About what? Aquaculture. Aquaculture, yes. We, we sort of, um, some of the early calculations of how much energy it takes in use came out to say that many of the types of aquaculture are not a good, are not efficient. But in fact, there are some with silk feeder, oyster clams, and things that you can grow in the water um, that can provide huge amounts of protein for relatively low energy costs. So I just want to put that on the table. It's I that we need to couldn't agree more. There is, of course, the biodiversity question involved. If you cut down mangroves to have uh, shrimp farms or so, it can be a disaster, in particular in cases of tsunamis. But um, in addition to that, you're absolutely right. Water is a wonderful substrate for protein production. Actually, uh, Exxon is propagating the idea of algae that can be turned into fuel. That's also a potential option. Again, I would have some warning about other implications, including biodiversity. But nevertheless, uh, water is a wonderful substrate.
in the German case, which is the only one I really know, the secret was persuading the social democrats and trade unions that reducing indirect labor costs was a very, very important political goal because Germany was very much suffering from its heavy weight, you could say dead weight, of indirect labor costs that are used to pay for the social, uh, social uh, security system. And if you can pay part of the social sec security costs by taxing energy, they feel happy. It's, it's a very nice revenue source. And um, this has actually be been the core of the considerations of Professor Hans Christoph Binswanger in Switzerland, who was the originator of the philosophy of the German ecological tax reform 10 years earlier. But he made his inroads into the parliamentary domain, using me as a vehicle, um, by uh, arguing the way I just did. And that, I believe, has been the winning story. Yes? Um, in your energy reduction scenario, or uh, I'm sorry, the energy price increase scenario, is that something the United States could do without giving up economic and geopolitical power? And if so, how? My feeling is, Yes, it could. It is a tragedy in a sense that America lost market shares in automobile manufacturing consistently over the last 50 years. And there are hardly any automobile exports any longer from American uh, car manufacturers because the Japanese and the Europeans simply were running ahead owing to higher petrol prices with more efficient cars and regaining some of that territory would be very good for the um, American economy. And um, cars is only one tiny segment. Ask Ask uh, Jeffrey Immelt of GE what his um, eco-imagination could mean for his company and for the nation. And he would say, of course, the success will depend on increasing energy prices. He explicitly said so in an interview with uh, Tom Friedman. So I believe it can be done. But then... Politics in America, as you see from Massachusetts, has different logics from the ones we have been discussing here. Okay, it's now half past one. So, thank you. <laughs>